Hello and welcome to Genes and Genetic Diseases. This is David Woodruff and I hope during this session we will get a chance to explore some of those things in our background that in our heritage that are going to control some of the disease processes we have and some of the specific features that people will exhibit that are different from each other. To explore a little bit of the background of genetic and developmental disorder, we want to be able to differentiate a little bit here between congenital disorders, those that are present at birth, which may either have a genetic or an environmental cause to them, or we can have malformations that cause defects within organs, for example, that may cause a disease process later in life. For example, if the person were to have a malformation of the heart or some other organ that could cause heart failure or other organ failure later on in life. Now some genetic disorders appear later in the development and would not be considered to be congenital however they're still a genetic disorder that has just presented later on in the person's lifetime. Many of the principles that we use to define inheritance come from Gregor Mandel, who identified these predictable transcriptions or predictable inheritance that occurred of specific traits between the parent and the child. We like to describe some of these things in terms of their phenotype, which is the outward physical and biochemical attributes to the person, as opposed to the genotype, which is the genetic makeup. Maybe one way to remember the difference here is to remember gene, genotype, as being the genetic piece, whereas phenotype is the way it's presented in the individual. And the chromatids are the two areas where we have chromosome units that are going to separate during meiosis, whereas our centromere is the point where those two chromatids are going to join. Human chromosomes occur in pairs, otherwise known as being diploid. One member or one piece of the pair comes from each parent, and even though the pairs look like they're identical, they have different DNA sequences because one comes from the mother, one comes from the father. Genes code for a particular trait, and even though they're located at the same position on the chromosome, they may come in different alleles. An allele is an alternative form that that gene may be expressed in. If they're both identical, we call it homozygous. If they're different, then we call it heterozygous. A Punnett square is a method of being able to identify whether or not a single gene trait could be expressed in the children from the parent. If it's dominant, that would be indicated by a capital letter, and if it's recessive, we would indicate that it is so by using a lowercase letter. Here is a Punnett square from two heterozygous parents where they have a capital A, for a dominant gene, and then they have a small a for the recessive gene for each one. Now notice that each one of these different situations, different children's situations here, is going to result in potentially a different kind of an expression of that gene. Now there are two in the upper right corner and the lower left corner that have the dominant and the recessive genes expressed. And then there is also the probability of having both recessive genes or both dominant genes by using a Punnett square. Now this helps us to be able to identify each time that the parent has an offspring. So we can't say if there's four offspring that each one of them is going to have a separate trait. They may all end up being somewhere else. But the probability that each individual one will have a certain characteristic or certain gene expression is going to be expressed by this. In other words, each child that is born will have a 25% probability of having both recessive or both dominant genes. And each child will have a 50% probability of having a dominant and recessive gene. A little bit more information about the Punnett square. It's based on the principle that all genes are independent and inherited in an individualized manner. As we already mentioned, there's a 25% probability of having the both dominant genes. There's a 25% probability of having both recessive and a 50% probability of having a dominant and recessive gene in each child that is born. So each child gets their own Punnett square. 
Genetic material may be passed down from the parents to the children in ways that are not normal. So we can have an inherited alteration of the genetic material can lead to chromosome alterations. We can also have base pair substitutions where one base pair is substituted for another. That's going to lead to an abnormal chromosome. We can have frame shift mutations occur too where there's either an insertion or deletion of some of our base pairs. This is going to cause an entirely new piece of genetic genetic material, which probably is not going to work the same way as the original was working. Mutation can occur spontaneously, or we can also have mutation occurring in hot spots along our chromosome. These are particular areas that are more prone to having mutation than other parts of the chromosome. As you have probably heard before, even in the popular media, there are things that are going to possibly cause genetic alterations such as radiation or chemicals. A number of different chemicals are listed here that can cause the person to have genetic mutations. As a little bit of background there, our chromosomes make up our somatic cells. They will contain 46 chromosomes. They are called diploid cells because they contain pairs. Whereas our gametes only contain 23 chromosomes and they're called haploid cells. Maybe one way to remember the difference here is hap kind of sounds like half. So it contains half of the amount of chromosomes that we have in a somatic cell. Autosomes make up the first 22 chromosomes. And then we have our sex chromosomes that make up the remaining pair. Ploidy refers to the number of sets of chromosomes that are in the nucleus of that biological cell. And again, we have diploid cells in our somatic cells, and we have haploid cells that are contained in the uh, sex chromosomes. But the other reason why we're using this terminology is because in some genetic situations, we may have more than the normal number more than these pairs we may have extra chromosomes and so that's why we're using the term ploidy to refer to the number of chromosomes that are contained when we talk about cells that are euploid we talk about cells that have the normal number of chromosomes so whenever you see eu eu in front of a word in the medical terminology that refers to the normal sets of cells that we have, so euploid would be normal. Now if we have multiples of those, we, if we have say for example three copies of each chromosome, we call it triploidy and four copies would be tetraploidy. Those type of fetuses rarely survive, however, when uh, the patient actually has those kind of genetic disorders. On the other hand, aneuploidy would refer to not having enough, so without having our normal pairing of chromosomes, and that usually leads to death. Although disjunction is a normal process that occurs during cell division, we can have non-disjunction occur, which can result in aneuploidy, and here what usually happens is the chromatids don't separate normally during meiosis or mitosis. So this picture is showing both a disjunction, which is supposed to happen, but also non-disjunctions occurring, which lead to a whole bunch of different types of genetic problems in the offspring. One of the best known types of aneuploidy is called Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21. Some of the characteristics that we see, which are important to know, is that there can be some mental retardation and there can be a low nasal bridge. We can have epicanthal folds, a protruding tongue, and poor muscle tone occurring in Down syndrome. The risk increases in the major risk factor that we find here is a maternal age greater than 35. This diagram here is showing a child who has Down syndrome and you can notice some of those features in this picture. 
So in this slide here, it is showing the increase that occurs in Down syndrome births with advanced maternal age. And you can see as that mother gets older, we start to have more and more chances of Down syndrome birth. In fact, when we hit about age 50, the risk of a Down syndrome birth is about 10%. So you might want to ask yourself, why would that occur? Why would the incidence of Down syndrome increase with advanced maternal age? Hopefully you've come to the conclusion that as the mother gets older, so do the eggs. Remember, the eggs form very early in life, and they are getting older as the mother gets older, which can lead to transcription errors and can lead to genetic abnormalities. Trisomy X is a female with three X chromosomes. This can lead to a variety of different symptoms going all the way from relatively asymptomatic to having mental retardation with sterility and menstrual irregularities. The symptoms are going to worsen for each additional X that occurs. So if we get to having four uh, Xs, then it's going to even be more symptoms. Notice the difference that occurs here with sex-linked disorders. So if we look at the affected father on the top, so the father has an X and a Y, and then the mother has two Xs, so you notice what happens here. Since the father has only one X to contribute, none of the sons are going to be affected at all. However, the daughters are going to be carriers, so the daughters are going to have one affected X. Now, if the mother is the carrier, so you notice there on the second picture to the right, you notice that the mother has that red X, and the father is not, so the father has nothing, then we're going to have a 50% of a chance of a carrier daughter, and we're going to have a 50% chance of an affected son. Okay, so we looked at some of the problems with X chromosomes. Let's take a look at one that involves a Y chromosome. This situation here, Klinefelter syndrome, we have two X's and one Y. The person will have a male appearance, however, may develop female-like breasts and have small testes, sparse body hair, and long limbs. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's a picture of a patient with Klinefelter syndrome, and you can see some abnormalities in the way of the development. So how could we end up having problems with chromosomes? Shouldn't they just replicate in a normal fashion? Well, we can have breakage of a chromosome occur. A lot of times that's physiologic, but most of our physiologic mechanisms will just repair the break. So we have systems in place designed to try to repair breaks that occur in our chromosomes. The problem occurs, though, when we add things to the body, such as viruses or chemicals or even ionizing radiation, that can lead to additional disruption of our chromosomes. cry du chat syndrome is a chromosome abnormality that is caused by a deletion of the short arm of chromosome 5 and this can lead to a low birth weight, mental retardation and microcephaly, that is a small brain. So a little A at the top is illustrating what we just talked about, having a deletion, we've lost part of our chromosome makeup and then we see in B here we see a normal crossing over pattern and then in C we have an unequal crossing over pattern leading to a duplication of one of our chromosomes but a deletion on the other arm. Now having a duplication is probably in most cases better than having a deletion. Let's see why. Having a duplication of genetic material can just result in having that material still expressed or having that gene still expressed. But if we delete part of that material, then there's going to be part of that gene that is not expressed as it is replicated. We can also have the inversion of genetic material so that when it's getting replicated, rather than going back into its original order, it flips part of that genetic material. So what we've done to illustrate that is using the letters here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 
and showing how it may become something different if replicated incorrectly. Another type of a genetic abnormality could be a translocation where the genetic information is being rejoined in an abnormal arrangement. Fragile sites are areas of the chromosome that appear to be fragile, to have distinctive bre breaks or gaps. So those are areas that might break off and could potentially cause some problems. However, we have not found an apparent relationship that between these fragile sites and disease. Fragile X syndrome is a situation where we have a fragile site on the long arm of the X chromosome, and this could result in or could be associated with mental retardation. It usually occurs in men because they only have one X chromosome. We have talked about the allele a little bit so far, but let's talk a little bit about these terms so you have a better idea what they mean when we're talking about genetics. So the locus is the position of the gene on the chromosome, and the allele is the particular expression, so it is the gene that has the at that given focus. So, for example, we can have an allele for hemoglobin A versus a, an allele for hemoglobin S, which is what we find in sickle cell anemia. In a homozygous situation, we have two identical genes, whereas in a heterozygous situation, we have two different genes. And here's some examples. O blood type is O and O, whereas AB blood type is A and B on the genetic pair. So if we have two alleles together, the one that is going to be observed is the one that is dominant. Dominant is going to be expressed in our Punnett square by using a capital letter, whereas recessive is expressed by using the lowercase letter. Alleles could be codominant. That is a possibility. A carrier is someone who is carrying a recessive gene. So in this case here, we're talking about sickle cell disease. We have to have a pair of recessive genes in order to be able to get the disease. So if the person has a tall S and a small S, or a, a lowercase s, we would say that the person is a carrier of sickle cell. However, if they have two recessive genes, then they would demonstrate the disease. To express a single gene disorder, we would have to have an abnormal allele be dominant and the normal one be recessive. When one parent is affected by an autosomal dominant disease and the other is normal, the occurrence and reoccurrence risk for each child are one half. So this Punnett square, or these pair of Punnett squares, are showing what would happen with a couple different matings with an autosomal dominant gene. So here in the first one at the top we have two affected parents and you notice that they're going to produce a homozygous affected individual and then two heterozygous affected individual and then one homozygous normal child out of that pairing. So now again, and I don't mean to be misleading when I'm talking about this Punnett square, it doesn't mean if they had four children that's how it's going to look. Each child has the same probabilities being proposed. So each child has a 50% chance of having a heterozygous affected, 25% uh, chance of being homozygous affected, and 25% chance of being homozygous normal. So then they have a 25% chance of not having the disease. However, if we have a normal parent and an infected parent listed at the bottom there as letter B, you notice that we have a 50% chance of being heterozygous affected and a 50% chance of being homozygous normal. Now just because somebody has a specific genotype, just because they have a specific gene makeup does not mean that they're necessarily going to express it. And that's what we refer to when we say penetrance. We talk about whether or not that specific genotype is also going to express itself as a specific phenotype. To what extent a genotype is expressed as a phenotype, we refer to that as being expressivity. So, with an autosomal recessive disorder, they must be homozygous for the abnormal trait. Usually occurs in the children and not the parents because they have to be able to have both recessive genes. Cystic fibrosis is an example. 
The recurrence risk can be figured by using a Punnett square. So when two parents are carriers of an autosomal recessive disease, the recurrence risk is going to be 25%. So here is our Punnett square for autosomal recessive disease. You notice that only one is going to have the homozygous affected. We're going to have two carriers and we're going to have one person who has both dominant genes and is normal. So a couple things to keep in mind then about sex-linked disorders would be that the Y chromosome only contains a few dozen genes, so most of our sex-linked traits are going to be linked to the X chromosome. And because men only have one, they're going to be more likely to be expressed in males than in females. In an X-linked recessive disorder, and most X-linked disorders are recessive, the males cannot transmit the genes to the sons because they're giving up their Y there, but they do transmit it to their daughters. Sons of female carriers have about a 50% risk of being affected. There are situations where more than just one gene comes into play. We might call that a polygenic type of inheritance. We can also have other types of genetic or environmental or lifestyle factors affect inheritance and we can have quantitative traits that are being measured on a continuous numeric scale. When we look at multifactorial inheritance there are two different pieces that we might refer to. One of them would be the liability distribution and the other would be the threshold of liability. As the number of multifactorial genes for the trait increases, the liability for that disease increases as well. And we reach a particular point in time called the threshold where the person is definitely going to be affected. But as that liability is increasing, other factors may also cause the person to be affected. But certainly once we hit that threshold, the person will be affected irregardless of other factors that may come into play. So why do we mention the difference? Because even though the liability remains the same between males and females, there could be a difference in where the threshold is depending upon if the person is male or female. Now there could be other characteristics as well. This is just one characteristic that might differentiate, but there could be other characteristics as well. They're going to move that threshold into different locations. This is what makes it multifactorial, is that we have multiple things coming into play, causing a change in the threshold. Due to multifactorial inheritance, there could be a number of different factors that could affect the reoccurrence, and we can see a major change between reoccurrence risk between populations. So in all, multifactorial and otherwise, there are many different factors that can lead to genetic disorders in our patients. It's important that we have a general understanding of genes and genetic disease so that we can understand and help our patients to understand what the difference would be between one patient and another and how they may express a disease. Thank you for joining me for Genes and Genetic Diseases. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.